concrete recommendations because this is not a, uh, it's an event which we hopefully can continue as early as possible. So please make a recommendation, uh, feel absolutely free to do so. So let me maybe introduce to you very briefly our, uh, our speaker. So we have Antonetta Angelova um, Krasteva. Um, An Antonetta is the head of unit um, from uh, DG Connect. So please be not surprised if you hear the name DG Connect. It was for a uh, known expert uh, DG Info in the past, but uh, then there is a new name now in circulation. So um, what is interesting uh, before joining the European Commission, um, Angelova uh, was actually uh, worked for the Justice and Home Affairs Councillor at the Bulgarian Permanent Representative representation to the European Union, uh, which gives her a deep insight into some of the matters which are really important uh, to all of us. Um, Alice uh, is in the moment not with us. Um, she will come. Oh, there she is. Wonderful. Uh, she's from the Ministry of Information and Communication. Um, she's the chair of the Kenyan Internet Governance Steering Committee and convener of the East African Internet Governance Forum and Kenyan ICT Action Network. Uh, and of course, uh, she's the vice chair of the ICANN government advisory body. Um, we are pleased to have you here as well. She will jump in and out of the meeting because she has to be on two panels. Um, but uh, whenever she's here, we are happy to have you here. When you're gone, we will feel the, lose, the loss. So, um, great to have you. Um, Yara Salam uh, is a managing uh, manager of the Women Human Rights Defenders Program, NASRA. And she worked as a professional legal assistant um, at the African Commission on Human Rights, Human and People's Rights uh, in, the, uh, in the Gambia. And she's currently program ma manager of the Women Human Rights Defenders Program um, at NASRA for Feminist Studies in Egypt. Uh, pleasure to have you here as well. Um, and Teresa Swinehart. Um, Teresa Swinehart is the executive director of the Global Internet Policy uh, Program of uh, Verizon. Um, Teresa Swinehart, uh, pr prior to joining Verizon in 2010, Teresa was Vice President, Global and Strategic Partnership for the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, um, where she had been since uh, 2001, and prior to this, uh, she was with MCI. So another very distinguished uh, speaker. Our lead discussant, Grace, um, Grace, where are you? There she is. Um, Grace uh, Gitaiga, Kenya ICT Action Network. Um, and she uh, also is affiliated with the Media Empowerment and Democracy in East Africa research program. And prior to joining, um, uh, do you say KitKat Net? KitKat Net, uh, she was the chair of the African chapter of the World Association of Community Broadcaster and an executive director at Econews Af Africa. So another very distinguished uh, participant of our panel. And uh, finally um, is Usha, uh, Usha uh, Rani, director institutional building um, of um, government of Andhra Pradesh from uh, India. And um, maybe just a little bit um, to give you some background. Um, she did uh, what I find very interesting certificate course in microfinance. Um, it's a kind of international institute in Canada, and she worked in Care International for 10 years. Um, and she's currently working uh, for Society uh, for Elimination of Rural Poverty, and she's a director of institutional building um, since there since the last 10 years. Is this correct? Uh, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, so we have a very distinguished panel, and let me move now directly to Antonetta with the, um, the first question. Um, and so my first question actually to, um, to Antonetta would be, uh, what are some of the existing internet, economic, and social educational opportunities for women? So do we have them? Are they already all in place? Is something missing? Is there a gap? What are, kind of skills are needed? Um, just give us some insight how you view this. Uh, thank you, Erika, and I'm really very glad to be here today with you. It's a bit difficult to, yeah, to hear, probably like that. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Put it on the I'm sorry for this Don't inconvenience. Worry. 
Yeah, okay, thank you. I hope that uh, now you can hear me. Thank you, Erika. Before uh, briefly uh, elaborating on this question, I just want to mention that I'm heading the unit responsible for stakeholders in DigiConnect, which is a recognition for the importance of uh, the various stakeholders involved in uh, information and communication uh, technologies. I think that uh, it goes beyond any doubt and it is uh, completely indisputable that the internet and modern technologies bring great opportunities, economic, social, cultural. And uh, they bring uh, this kind of opportunities to all of us, uh, both men uh, and women. Um, we take for granted everything that we have today, but these were unthinkable things uh, 10 years ago. And we can imagine um, with this pace of innovation, what kind of new opportunities we will have in 10 years' time. In order to reap the full benefit of the opportunities created by modern technologies, um, what do we need exactly? We need, first of all, digital skills. And this is particularly important uh, for women in order to make sure that uh, they really get benefit from the opportunities created by uh, modern technologies. These are skills could be basic and advanced and they give them various uh, opportunities like empowerment, like greater economic, social, political and cultural participation and also uh, benefit to um, access to their rights, rights from uh, discrimination. What is particularly important is uh, to make sure that investments in infrastructure actually go together with investments in digital uh, skills, digital skills for women which uh, uh, empower them. And one uh, final point, we have to think in um, um, knowledge economy about skills um, as a microfinance because we all agree that microfinance is crucial and fostering social innovation. This is the way we should consider digital skills as a microfinancing, fostering social innovation and improvement. Uh, and I would be very much interested to hear during the discussion why we do still have too, uh, a too low number of women, uh, girls studying STEM, science, technologies, uh, mathematics, and why, do, uh, why we don't still have enough women in uh, ICT. But I think that these are issues which will be further elaborated in our discussion. Thank you. Antoinette, I thank you so much. I think that's a very valid point raised, and we will come back to them. Alice, can I move to you? Um, Alice, um, what, what I, you fine? Okay. Um, so how would you say that um, women's rights can be enhanced through the access uh, to information and the internet, um, including the use um, to address issues of abuse or technology-related violence? This is one, I know it's an issue which is important for you. Maybe you'd like to talk about it a bit? Uh, okay. Um, must have been, uh, Kenya, we've been engaged in, uh, in quite an interesting uh, research study uh, to actually provide an insight into whether cybercrime affects women differently. And it was, uh, it was conducted specifically in Kenya so that it could offer um, informed uh, discussions into a policy development process because we are currently de developing a cyber, cyber crime framework uh, from a governmental perspective. The government is working with other stakeholders to come up with a national cyber crime framework. So that's the reason uh, for this research. And what we discovered is that cyber crime does affect women very differently. And it has affected them, obviously, because of what I think the former speaker spoke about, the, 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 the fact that many women are um, uh, accessing ICTs. I would like to refer them to ICTs because for Kenyan women, it's, it goes be, it beyond just the Internet. And in fact, most Kenyan women would be accessing the Internet using their mobile phones. And then there's also, you know, uh, you know other... Uh, other technologies. So I think it's important to make that point that uh, mobile phones are actually an important aspect. And what we discovered, and I think Grace is going to provide uh, more uh, details regarding this, this uh, the study uh, and, uh, and results we found, is that there's quite, it's, it's prevalent, it's getting even worse as more and more Kenyans are getting access to the internet. 
uh, women having disadvantaged, been disadvantaged before but not having access to some of these tools are obviously uh, naive and gullible in, 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 in using them, uh, including using uh, innovative facilities like uh, mobile money, M-Pesa. Uh, they are quite gullible to issues of fraud. Uh, and then uh, violence against women using SMSs, uh, internet, uh, using some of the social networks, uh, and they are affected very dif differently because some of the abuse is actually very gender specific, uh, sexual of a sexual nature, uh, of you know pornographic nature, you know uh, abusing uh, the career of, of a specific woman, uh, you know. So it actually damages, uh, and we've had three or four case studies where some women have actually. Uh, stopped using mailing lists and, and even uh, networks like uh, like Facebook. So from a government perspective, it's actually looking at how we, we, we develop policy uh, and work with other stakeholders because it's not just about policy. You also have to work with the technical community and the and industry to ensure that you're coming up with uh, various ways of dealing with this. So there's the technology, at, uh, a technology uh, perspective, there's the policy perspective, and there's also the industry perspective in terms of having ISPs perhaps come up with a gender uh, gender sensitive policies when they when they're uh, drawing up, uh, for example, uh, contracts uh, with uh, with the customers uh, and also uh, providing uh, services. And so that is what is important in that the government then takes the lead in ensuring that any policy framework is also gender sensitive. Uh, and encouraging industry and the technical community to also come up with ways of developing other uh, other other ways of of, uh, of uh, dealing with cyber cyber violence against women to ensure that we get everybody uh, on the internet uh, because that of, you know we obviously know that uh, they make more than 50 percent of Kenya's population uh, and the government is trying very hard to make sure that you know more and more girls are doing uh, science and technology and more and more women are engaged. Uh, in, in, over, in developing innovation and creative way, in creative applications uh, that target women. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think there's one point which I think you raised, which is interesting. The study is the study available in English? Uh, yes, it's available in English. So I think what we should do. Anybody who makes a comment in relation to a study or documentation you did, maybe uh, Aisha, we can uh, maybe just receive this. And then don't know what we will do with it, but it would be nice to make it available. We can certainly include the link in our report on this workshop. Yeah, I would. I would like this. It's always sad when information gets lost. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so um, I'm moving to um, Yara Salam. So um, you are very much engaged in human rights-related uh, issue. So what are some of the challenges that human rights defenders like you actually face in this particular environment and with regard to the particular question uh, we are debating? So, um, so I think m uh, what I will be speaking about really builds up on the, on the two uh, interventions because um, I will concentrate on one thing. It's the online campaigning against women human rights defenders. Uh, at the moment in Egypt, since the start of the revolution, there has been the public space has been open uh, in, a, in a bigger manner for women uh, activists, and uh, a lot of them are new activists, so they are not very familiar with the threats, whether offline or online. Um, and just to give an example on uh, many uh, many campaigns and attacks against uh, activists in general. And uh, people usually use pictures, uh, pictures that are available on Facebook uh, or use comments that are posted on uh, public groups on Facebook or pages. So uh, the last thing we had was um, a, a woman activist who's running a page called the, the Girls' Revolution in Egypt. And she's, um, she got uh, sexual attacks uh, on one of the pictures that she posted. She posted a, a woman breastfeeding her child, and she got, like, huge attacks. Of, uh, she, she did a screenshot of, uh, of the insults, and she reposted it through her own uh, account. But also, again, um, when, when people are trying to attack revolutionaries or activists in general, 
uh, at the end of the day, if they take a picture of a man uh, drinking a beer or uh, or dancing, it wouldn't affect so much women, uh, but uh, it wouldn't affect him. I'm sorry. Uh, but then when they use it for women activists, uh, this would totally uh, blow up their reputation and credibility. So not only, so for example, if a woman is drinking generally, she wouldn't do it in public because if someone took a picture of her, which people don't actually uh, ask your permission before, uh, if you're in a party, uh, and it's posted online, you don't know about it, and suddenly there's a campaign saying, look at uh, the revolutionaries, they, are, they don't have any morals, they're against Egyptian traditions and so on, and it's totally sideline you from the public space, and they say that they don't believe in what you're doing is really about the revolution. It's about uh, uh, Western ideas and bringing up foreign agenda to, to Egypt. Um, we had also, um, the, these pictures were used in a campaign against one a political activist that I, that I know of. Uh, pictures of her and her boyfriend, her drinking beer and so on. And it was huge to the effect that she had to be away from the political life for a while so that people would actually forget about uh, the videos. And the videos were annexed with name of doctors who have activists and it was a huge, huge campaign in the beginning. So I think uh, one thing that people are not aware of is uh, how they protect themselves online. Uh, so uh, they really don't understand what are the term of agreement for social websites or how they can protect themselves. So I don't know if, if, if it's possible to maybe make the default is too private. And when people want to be more public, would, would that be possible? I have no idea, but this is a question to everyone. Thank you so much. Um, Teresa, um, you have access to micro? Okay. So what are examples you think, you know, from an industry point of view, um, either industry can undertake or industry already undertook, um, so to, to make actually to help women and to assist women in the different technical environments? I mean many business I see uh, representatives on the table so we all come from different environment but maybe there are certain points you can raise which you say these are common uh, uh, you know recommendations you would like to make or points you would love to refer to is that working yes, yes. okay wonderful um, I think first we have to take a, a couple observations um, one which um, has occurred over the past 24 hours even at this event. I think oftentimes I keep hearing from people that maybe the discussion around uh, women in ICT is um, no longer necessary or maybe things have changed. But I think that there's actually an underlying um, strong need for that. Uh, we've seen over um, at this morning's opening session, we had two women who were um, participating. Um, there's many women in leadership positions involved uh, in internet governance related issues. I was on a panel yesterday where um, we had one panel where we had one gentleman and uh, the rest were ladies and women uh, involved in um, the internet governance related dialogues and interestingly enough that created a dialogue with the audience. Um, and so what struck me really is that we haven't quite reached that balance yet um, of women in internet governance and a, a sense of where it's no longer a conversational point. Uh, so we still have some work to do. I think we've also seen um, in the context of business um, that there's a demonstration in management teams um, that if you have a diversity um, among the management team that uh, you have uh, economic uh, success for the company. And out of Europe, there were some very amazing studies on that. So I think the real question is how do we get there? And I'll get to the point of what business can do, but I want to touch first on how we get uh, to an infrastructure that actually allows that. Um, so OECD came out with a study uh, this year about women's economic empowerment, and they really observed the need to take a holistic approach towards this. And that meant identifying the social and political factors that minimized women's inability to participate such as access to family planning and health care, girls' uh, completion of uh, primary education, uh, improving literacy rates, uh, increasing their influence in government and political decision making. So I would highlight that also in leadership roles and opportunities. And that ultimately a country's success in empowering women depended on a multifaceted and response approach to its public policy management implementation, including its macroeconomic, financial and trade policies. So from a business perspective, what does that mean? 
Well, from an IT business perspective, I think it means that we have to make sure that we are moving towards a fully connected world, that we are investing in infrastructure, broadband, the next generation, uh, and doing that responsibly, that we have um, policies and regulatory approaches that do not harm the free flow of information, but actually enable it in a way so that women are also equally empowered. If we have internet connectivity issues, it affects all segments of the population and women can oftentimes be most affected. Um, if we look at this then and we take it towards health and educational opportunities where businesses themselves can play a role, we also have to make sure that there's no barriers uh, to opportunities to enable e-health and e-initiatives. From a business perspective itself then, taking it from the broader, ensuring that there's an infrastructure and there's a holistic approach to enabling women to engage in a full capacity. Um, individual companies can also undertake initiatives, for example, um, opportunities to work remotely from home, contributing towards educational initiatives in their communities and uh, contributing towards educational opportunities for the science and technology, taking in interns during the summer, things of that sort. Uh, within our own company, we've also undertaken initiatives uh, to ensure uh, some programs around domestic violence, um, the uh, providing of mobile phones and the providing of an application for the mobile phone device that enables one to contact the national hotline for domestic violence and receive help right away. These are important programs. They serve the communities, and they also use the technology to help empower and enable that generation. So I think from a business perspective, there's multiple angles towards achieving the success. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, so let's move to the discussion now. So the, the first two discussions which we have, but feel free, you can, you can jump in now or you can wait. If you want to listen a little bit more to the discussion and you jump in during the discussion, that's perfectly fine. It's completely up to you. Just give me a sign. And then I want to recognize that we are remotely connected. So we are internet and we have remote participants. So it's not just the people here in the room. Um, welcome very much, and we do have actually um, 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 a moderator who is moderating the online questions or comments, Mrs. Raquel uh, Gatto. Um, she's a member of the IGF Remote Participation Working Group, Director at Internet Society from the Brazilian chapter, is that correct? Wonderful to have you here. And we have a rapporteur as well. Where is our rapporteur? Shana Finnegan, are you hiding? Shana is sitting up and at the end. Um, she's pro project assistant, internet rights and human rights from the APC. Um, thank you to, uh, to have you here as well. So, either Usha to get the ball rolling, Grace, or somebody from the panel. Grace, go ahead, please. You wanted your question or you, you just get it rolling without my question? Perfect. I think... Um I, I think uh, it's to build on what the other speakers have said, um, but to also give some examples. For example, um, in, in, in Kenya, where we have had the debate of how do you, you know, how do you combat violence against women before you go into the whole uh, debate about uh, combating uh, technology which is still being seen as an elitist tool um, and that women are not embracing because they have other needs and the fact that they want technology to first of all be um, useful for them in, in order for them to embrace. Um, and, and, and the fact that you want these issues to be taken seriously by the legislators who unfortunately uh, from an African context happen to be men so you know in parliament you have the you know predominant um for example our parliament with um almost uh, 300 to nine you have you know less than 20 women and the rest are men so um you know this this is a challenge because uh, women issues are continue to be seen as soft issues um and therefore how do you work with this? So a concrete example uh, of Kenya is um, the fact that we have a constitution which we, we voted for in 2010. And in this constitution, it provides for the fact that in any leadership position, not one single gender should be more than two-thirds. So if you have more than that, then you have to make sure 
that this other one third, you know, how do you feel that? Now, the challenge is we have not come up with a formula to implement how that will be done. And debates have been going on, but nobody has given us a single formula of how we will implement that. So in, in, in as much as the Constitution is the supreme law of land, and the fact that um, any law that is inconsistent with the Constitution will either have to be repealed or amended, and it recognizes the sovereignty of the people, and the people have said, we want you know and you know we talk of gender but we know it is women we want women to also be represented so you know you know th those are the challenges of how we are going to implement into that before we can even move into technology based violence however uh, those of us who have been following on the issues um, are, are saying you know let's let's not just sit and wait because technology is is is, is dynamic it's involving uh, every day and you know in all situations law has to play catch up with technology so technology uh, has to move and so what do we do Alice did point out about the need to work with uh, with service providers that um, there is now an effort to actually convince service providers in their user agreements to also consider the fact that women are experiencing um, technology-based violence. And this is based on the study she talked about. We conducted it in 2010. It is called Technology and we Women and Technology, the Dark Side of ICTs, and it is there online if you just... Uh, Google Kicktonet study on women, you'll be able to pull it out. It's also on the APC website, uh, and it's also on the on the on the gender uh, dot it website. Marvelous, uh, Usha. Can I bring you into the discussion because you come from a, a different uh, world uh, from India? So why don't you explain a little bit how you are observing the issue and the work you are doing? Regarding the technology, uh, whatever the party panelists here, they have raised uh, they have raised very interesting uh, observations. So the first observations, what uh, Teresa in fact raised, is uh, related to the family planning, the women's participation in the family planning, and also Grace raised about uh, the implementation of law and other things. I will just quote uh, my own examples from my own uh, state. Uh, see, uh, just to put it in context, actually I am working uh, in an organization called Society for Elimination of Rural Poverty and we are covering uh, 12 million members in this particular organization and all are women. And we are having uh, small self-help groups, 100,000 self-help groups are there. So all these self-help groups are actually involved in various socio-economic activities. So as part of the economic empowerment also, actually these organizations are involved in uh, providing the microfinance, microinsurance and micro pension facilities to the rural poor people. And also in the economic side actually they are into the agriculture, dairy development and also uh, the commodity marketing and other activities. And in the, in the social aspects if you see, uh, they are actually uh, into the health related activities and uh, the gender and also the disability related activities. For example, if I quote uh, the examples in the health sector, uh, in the health sector actually we have given mobiles to the women. So in the mobile, like with the help of the mobiles, the women are actually uh, entering what is the birth weight of the children at the uh, Anganwadi center, that is the health center basically and also they are plotting the growth also, the growth chart and other things. So because in India, the mall, uh, if you see uh, our uh, IMR, the infant mortality rate and the MMR are very, very high when compared, even it is much worse than uh, uh, sub-Saharan countries. So but through this intervention, so now there are a lot of policy changes at a very higher level. So, in fact, in our uh, organizations, we are using uh, a multiple technologies. One, we are using the mobile tech mobile based technology. The second one, we are using the web based technology. The third one is IVRS technology and the smart cards. So, in the mobile technology, for uh, because uh, uh, in uh, in India, the literacy levels, especially among women, is very very low. It is around 30 percent only. So if they have to actually provide the microfinance services to the members, it is very difficult for them to maintain the books of accounts and they don't know uh, even for accessing the government programs uh, by the women. 
so here through this mobile like we have introduced one mobile technology whereby they got information of all 12 million like uh, this 12 million member information in that and every month they are capturing all the financial transactions of all the members related to their loans access to the credit their savings amounts their insurance related amounts and the pension related amounts similarly the mobile technology has been used for improving the agricultural practices so whereby actually they are transferring the technology how can they increase the agriculture so uh, and uh, the, the another one is like uh, there is one act actually given the uh, for the wage seekers so the wage laborers for them there is one act in india that is called as uh, 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 national employment guarantee scheme in that 100 days of wages and entitlement for the poor people so earlier for implementation of these kind of programs government governments used to face lot of problems but due to this mobile technology what is happening is the government is able to ensure that each and every person is getting 100 100 days of age employment and also the women are getting equal wages in india getting equal wages is a very big issue but through this mobile technology we are able to actually ensure that women also get the equal wages along with the men so like this various if we go into that for example the pensions for the old age people even for the disabled people it is there so earlier like uh, there were a lot of leakages and other thing now through this smart card intervention so the old people just like any salaried person so they are able to get on the first of every month their pension amount they are able to get on at their doorstep so these are some of the things I mean, these are very concrete examples um, we heard both from Grace and from Usha and the participants before. So I would love to include you into the discussion. Please feel free. Just say your name and your affiliation and join us into the debate. Grace, just, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I, just, I just need to, to, to say, I forgot to, to mention that, that as part of uh, our work, we are also um, updating the study. And one of the issues to, that we want to look is to assess whether um, there has been an increase on uh, use of internet by women. Uh, what is the current situation? Uh, is violence against women on the increase? What are the prevalent forms that are being used for this? Uh, is there action being taken? Say, are women reporting uh, about what has happened to them? and uh, what effect is this having on women and uh, that is also part of a wider project that is uh, we are undertaking with APC uh, it's going to take on seven countries and we you know we will also be mapping the we will also be mapping where technology uh, based violence is predominant on Ushahidi map uh, and using uh, frontline SMSs, and maybe Jack, who is heavily involved as a part of the leadership of that program, can make more comments in the discussion. Oh sure, oh sure, she certainly will get a chance, but in a moment, um, just let me go around and see if somebody else wants to participate. So, please, scream now. Don't be shy, don't be shy. We have a micro, we would love to have your experience. Women or men feel completely free. Um, yes, please. Can we give it over? Just give your name and your affiliation. My name is Nikhat and I'm from Pakistan. Um, I work for an organization, Digital Rights Foundation, and I've been working on Take Back the Tech campaign, uh, closely working with APC. Um, it's not a question, it's, it's a comment, and I'm very confused about it. I've been working on Take Back the Tech campaign since three years now. And uh, I hope everyone knows about Malala incident which happened in Pakistan. Uh, after, uh, and I closely worked with Malala on Take She was actually a very active Take Back the Tech campaigner also. Uh, when uh, she was, um, when this incident happened, I started writing articles that how she was actively engaged in uh, raising awareness in education in conflict zones and all that. And I started getting threats on internet. Where people from different authorities, even people from Taliban, they actually used online spaces. They, they called me Western agent. They called me the, the person with an agenda. 
who is actually uh, promoting a girl who is promoting education in the conflict zones. And education is actually not the thing of Taliban, right? But what I faced that I didn't get any support from the authorities as well. I uh, reported the incident. I gave them all the links. That, so this is, this is something which is happening to me. I'm a women human rights defender, so what kind of support I can get from my government? And they were completely silent on that. And ultimately, I had to get support from APC, from other international organizations. I, I had to take down my articles. I had no other choice because I was getting threats for me, for my family. I stopped going to the to office. So, I mean, I'm, I'm confused about it, that in, in countries like Pakistan, in India, where they don't have cybercrime legislation, where, where they don't have any policies which actually address human, human rights de defenders who are facing threats in the online spaces, how they will get support, how they will have these spaces in, in, in the policy making where they can kind of, you know, address and kind of ask the legislators to uh, look on these issues as well. Thank you. Um, I think that's um, not just an important question, but I mean, the, the topic you raise refers to all of us because we are all engaged in different international settings, either as corporation or ICC um, or the IGF. So all of us, uh, the, um, your organization, all of us. So I think we should definitely find a way to make your point, uh, you know, we raise it to the international level and I'm sure there's a way to finding, um, you know, a way that it will be addressed in the future. It's, it's, it's an absolutely important one. I don't know if anybody of you want to make a point, but otherwise I just would love to go around because we have, uh, if I'm not completely mistaken, something like 12 minutes or 15 minutes left. Am, am I correct? Or is my watch wrong? We have until 6 o'clock. We have until 6 o'clock. Marvelous. So we are much more relaxed. Wonderful. My watch is running. It's, a, it's running away. So, um, perfect. Yes, please, the gentleman over there. Hi. Hi, my name is Danaraj Thakur. I'm from University of West Indies in Jamaica. So I wanted to go back to the, I wanted to go back to the point that the first speaker made about um, STEM education. And um, I, I refer to Jamaica because um, in that situation, for example, a tertiary level education for several years, or maybe 10, 15 years, um, women's participation has um, completely outnumbered men. And so that has come to dominate the discourse about education in general. In other words, people perceive there to be people people perceive there to be a, a bias in terms of more women and than men. And so the discourse has been shaped by the notion of male marginalization generally. But when we talk about um, STEM education, then it's completely reversed. And there's a significant underrepresentation of women. But I wonder then, in trying to change that, if one of the big obstacles is, you know, is, would also require trying to change that perception of there being a problem in the first place. And I think the, the problem is that, it, again, this is in the Jamaican case, people might not feel that there's a, prob, uh, a problem of underrepresentation of women in the STEM disciplines because generally they feel that men are being marginalized, you know, in education in general. Yeah, if somebody wants to answer immediately, but just keep it short. I would love to have as many participants as possible. Please. Uh, I can do it later. Uh, no, first. go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, comment, and I'm very happy that you actually made it indeed. Uh, women and girls outnumber boys in education, but uh, in STEM, as you said, uh, this is not the case. For Europe, for example, for the OECD countries, the percentage of uh, boys going to STEM study, though very low, is around 18%, while this number for girls is only 5%. And this actually reduces, uh, diminish their access to other benefits they can have, economic, social, cultural. Uh, therefore, it is indeed very necessary. I do agree that it is a matter of perception and there is a lot to be done for changing, for cultural and structural changes in order to 
um, change this. Very uh, briefly to say that we are looking uh, in the Commission at these issues because we do believe that uh, participation of girls, uh, women and men, boys and men in ICT is not only an equation uh, question. There is an economic argument at this, but we are looking now and we are uh, carrying uh, out a study in order to see what are the reasons and how, how we can improve the situation. Okay. Please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name's Cheryl Langdenor. I wear a number of hats, but what's important around this table is uh, I'm a member of something called Females in Information Technology and Telecommunications and a number of similar and allied groups. Uh, also guilty of being uh, an old uh, list member of Unifem, uh, and I was just wondering in response to, to your particular issues, the notes I was uh, sharing with Teresa, if you wonder what we were doing, basically say, reporting of issues must have a, and in brackets, a cross-border public and neutral, question mark, question mark, system and follow-up. They need to be predictable, transparent and accountable, and I wrote, a role for UN women to facilitate and that would allow us to have the, the global approach and the local solutions, but with a, a layer of escalation. And I'd be very surprised, certainly I can speak on behalf of, uh, of the UN Women Australia, that we, we would be supportive of that, and I would suspect every other chapter would be as well. Maybe we can come back to you a little bit later again on this topic because I'm uh, more to the end so that we really ensure that all your recommendation on all the points raised here were taken on and concrete actions and recommendation. Otherwise, I know how easy it is that things get lost. Yes, they disappear in the cloud, which is not a good idea. Teresa, you want to jump into this? Um, yes, just from the observation that we often talk about um, the online and offline world, but um, around issues um, of uh, initiatives for women in the offline world, it seems that there's also a premise for um, application in the online world. Um, so this observation um, that's just been made, I think, is something to factor into our, some of our national dialogues and with our government officials that measures have been taken and they should apply online as well. Hi, uh, my name is Eileen Guo, and I uh, I'm work. Can you speak up a little bit? Hi, uh, my name is Eileen Guo, and uh, I'm currently conducting an. Uh I think you have to eat a micro. <laughs> is this better? Okay. Uh, my name is Eileen, and I'm uh, currently doing an ethnography of social media and mobile technology use in Afghanistan. Um, and, and the point that you just made about online and f offline worlds connecting, I find so relevant because in Afghanistan especially, a lot of the issues that women face online are entirely reflective of the issues that they face offline. And it's everything from access to mobile technology and to, to internet being controlled by the men in their family to, to bigger issues of cybercrime and all of that. Um, but, but my question from, from my research, sorry, um, my question for my research as, as uh, my question from my research um, being a Western woman from the United States and doing this research on social media and women a in Afghanistan is that the issues that we face as women seem so different and the issues of opportunity that we're talking about even here are so different. And so I wonder if grouping women's opportunities all together when the opportunities that we're talking about in developed countries like Europe and the West and opportunities that we're talking about in Pakistan and Kenya and Afghanistan, um, if it might actually be hurting the movement and if we're not, uh, if there isn't some better way of, of fighting for all of these opportunities. Somebody make love to make a comment on this point? Question, I think you got the question. Uh, the main um, question was, if we're not hurting women's interest, if we group, if we're too broad and in our question and if we're not specific enough and differentiate sufficiently between um, women's interest and in countries like Pakistan or countries like Afghanistan, 
certain African regions or the more well educated, the less educated, the more access to information, less access to information. So just maybe reflect on it so we don't lose the question. I don't see anybody who wants to respond immediately. You, wonderful. Uh, but just let's keep it in mind. If you want to come back to these questions, maybe uh, wonderful. I take you first. Is that fine with you? And then I come back to you. Uh, Valentina from Bosnia. Can you hear me? Uh, I have one uh, one question related with what Yara was saying before about uh, privacy by default. A lot in our experience also in Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, and in the Balkans, let's say, a lot of the violence that uh, the women activists perceive, they become online and offline. And they start from online and then, of course, they uh, are heavily beaten in their, uh, r on the real body, let's say. So my question was, uh, if term of reference are a general norm, and term of reference uh, give uh, to the service provider the equal and same right of the user, Maybe the big uh, service provider like Google, Google Plus, uh, Facebook, and all the social network, the majority of organizations use for their advocacy purposes, maybe they should have uh, a different terms of right based on human rights because those people risk their lives and the general term of reference put their life uh, seriously at risk. And this is regarding the, the social networking because they are the main platform of each and every activist in the world, because they are free. Free means they are not, you don't pay. And usually activists are not the, the, the world, uh, world in their own society. The second, it's about uh, uh, getting women on uh, ICT skills. Because uh, if, uh, it's, uh, if uh, it's true, but uh, there is no awareness in the singular country about this. There is no awareness in the local, uh, I would say, UN chapter and so on. There is no awareness in the government because they think they have other priorities. Bosnia Herzegovina still has not an information society agency. There is no a plan. So how we can get the women on board if the country has not an understanding what human capital uh, means? If they don't care, they don't cure any of their human capitals, even less women capital. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't want to dominate the discussion, but I'd like to uh, I come back to this point about what social media can do more later at the end, So, because otherwise we just get carried away with this debate. I would love to come back to the question um, uh, the young lady raised over there. Um, I, th I thought you wanted to make a re reply, please. Um, sure. Uh, I, I think that if you apply the same standards for what, what is an opportunity that presents for all women, you would be unfair to uh, all of them because you, you're talking about different contexts. But another, another framework that you can do is stick to the human rights framework. We have a universally recognized human rights framework that can be applied for everyone. It's, it's for all. Uh, you cannot really argue about the the context. You can, you, you can talk about how you want to apply it, but, but we have to all remember that uh, the online world is, is the platform where, where um, all of us, including women, exercise their human rights, like uh, access to information, freedom of expression, uh, the right of association people organize over online platforms. Um, so this can be a universal opportunity so to say, if you want to, if you want to talk about how uh, how this represents uh, another uh, area where uh, women on the offline world cannot really um, access it, or maybe uh, it's too dangerous for them. So, for example, if we talk about Egypt, when there's too much restrictions uh, in the offline world, uh, you can always go back online, which brings me to uh, how the cy cyber crimes legislation. I don't know if we want the governments to actually enact cyber crimes legislation because they're always concerned with their own security uh, the state security and everything else uh, doesn't matter so the person the individual is not in the equation to start with other than being an enemy uh, potential enemy uh, so yeah this this is my thoughts so far so I have yes it is you first a gentleman here and then I have a gentleman here sitting in the um, second row um. Hello, everyone. Uh, do you hear me? Okay. 
Uh, my name is uh, Omar Ansari, and I'm from Afghanistan. Uh, uh, I'm president of the National ICT Alliance of Afghanistan, and I'm uh, founder of uh, Tech Women Afghanistan. It's a network of uh, women in technology that uh, uh, hel helps develop the leadership of women in uh, technology. Um, uh, I have a computer science background. And I've been involved in uh, software localization for Afghanistan, worked with Microsoft, uh, Google, and a few other uh, 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 companies, uh, uh, software vendors, to develop software for Afghanistan so that people can uh, uh, use it. Um, there is a, a, a method in uh, software uh, development. It's called, uh, or software localization. Uh, localization itself is when you transform a software from one language to another language according to the cultural uh, and social norms of uh, a particular country. This is called software localization. And that enables people to use the, the software in their uh, region. Um, the, the reason I'm mentioning this is that uh, uh, as a suggestion, at the, uh, uh, um, add uh, make to the uh, women uh, rights organizations is that uh, if you're designing uh, or you're planning or programming for countries like uh, Afghanistan, Egypt, and uh, Pakistan, India, where uh, there are cultural uh, sensitivities to certain issues, you need to localize your programs. Uh, but customize your programs according to the cultural norms of the people. For example, if you demand the Islamic rights of women in an Islamic country, that resolves about 90% of the global women rights issues in, a, uh, uh, in that particular country. And one of the, the basic rights is right to education that Islam has given, and it's it's made it compulsory on uh, on every woman to to uh, to to educate. You know, not only herself, but uh, but uh, 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 the male and female and support education in a society. Uh, and the uh, right to speak. Uh, this is uh, what Islam has given to the women. But uh, well, if we, uh, for example, in a country like Afghanistan, uh, demand the, the, uh, the rights of women that is given based on a Western, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, policy, that will definitely create sensitivities and it will create challenges for the women rights activists in those countries. So the first thing they should do is prioritize their activities. Uh, go for the programs that is in accordance to the cultural uh, 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 norms and the religious norms of the center. And then after that, once that is resolved, in the second phase, you can go to the other. This is just the thought. Thank you. Thank you. That's, um, that's a very interesting recommendation. I have, is this okay if I just, is it directly to this and the same? I, 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 we should not go too much into the discussion. I can imagine that many of you um, have many ideas, you know, in, in addition. Please, go, 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 sure. Feel free. So, I was, I was in the Please wait for the micro. I, I'm, I'm, I want to respond to this comment. Um, it's, uh, what I am doing in Pakistan is all Islamic. Everything comes into, like, I'm working for the education of the girls. I'm working for raising awareness in so many different areas. It's not an Islamic, and we have Islamic government, so it's the right of the Islamic government to give me the protection. So where was it, right? It wasn't a Western thing, right? It wasn't the Western thing. It was all in the principles which actually comes into Islam. So please don't kind of, you know, don't make the different, different uh, like it's not like Eastern and Islamic and Western. That's what I heard, the similar comment I heard, I faced on uh, internet, that I, I'm doing something, you know, Western, I'm a Western agent. I'm doing a, you know, Western, uh, whatever. So. Yeah, please, but keep it, again, keep it short. We, we want to continue. 
I uh, completely support what you're doing in Pakistan. I'm, I'm, I'm never against what uh, uh, you're promoting in Afghanistan, but I really appreciate I have been following you on Twitter and uh, Facebook and uh, been reading your articles and whatever. But there is one thing. Uh, look at Malala's case. Malala say that whenever I see a beard, it reminds me of something really. I mean, this is what Taliban has been putting on Facebook to, in order to, uh, 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 to defend what they have done uh, and, uh, and gain the public support uh, uh, for it. And uh, uh, I'm not if it's if it's true she said it or not, but I, uh, because I've never uh, I've never had Malala uh, on that, or, nor I seen a video of that. And the other thing she said about uh, um, not can we sure can we the, can we just withdraw from this individual case because many of us may not know the case. Uh, I think we got the difference, which is the most important, uh, the, the, the difference between the two of you, your argument. There are similarities, the way you see it, similar, and there are differences. So let's keep it at this at this stage, if you agree. Yes, yeah, sure. I'd love to bring others into the discussion. Is this fine with you? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I just wanted to... Uh, sure, I, I sure. do support well, what she's doing. It's just, well it's understood, uh, absolutely. I think we all understood so where you agree and where you have a different opinion. Thank you so much for the two of you. Uh, please. Good afternoon. Um, hoping that you. Good afternoon. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is George uh, Nyabuga. Uh, I'm from Kenya, but I work at uh, Afrinic, which is based in Mauritius. This is the Internet Registry for Africa. And my comments relate to uh, what the young lady who is doing an ethnographic study uh, uh, said. And this is about the use of technology uh, for various uh, uh, courses and various um, uh, issues. Uh, the first thing that I would want to say is that uh, technology is never neutral. Uh, that uh, the way uh, or the kind of effects that we get from the use of technology, and in, in this case the internet, is based on the modalities of use. How do we apply uh, the internet and technologies in various uh, uh, situations? Uh, uh, given the fact that uh, you know, uh, really the internet remediates uh, what we call remediates or refashions what happens offline, it means that unless there is serious cultural change, there is uh, a, a serious uh, a change uh, uh, on the way people do things. Technology alone will not. Uh, engender any uh, any change in any society, and I come from Africa, where, for example, the what happens online is a reflection of actually what happens offline. So we should, I think, uh, be uh, be more critical about uh, the uh, impact, for example, of various technologies, uh, the internet, on uh, gender issues, for, for for instance, and look at a society from a wider perspective and more critically, in in the sense that. In a male-dominated society, the internet alone will not change the way things are done unless you engage in very serious uh, uh, ways of doing things, unless you engage in trying to change uh, the cultural aspects, the culture of doing things. Nothing is going to change just because of technology. Thank you. Yeah, we, um, okay, the lady, lady here, and then we go over to you. I don't know, please just raise your hands like this. Sometimes it's very easy to overlook some of you. Sorry for this. So um, it, one of the ideas, uh, sorry, Nadine Sharif with the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies uh, out of Cairo. Um, one of the things I had worked both in the US context and in Egypt. And one of the things that I realized moving to Egypt is coming from a different context and a different sort of culture, you have certain pre-notions, no matter how open you are, no matter how close you are to that. I was uh, born in Egypt, I would go back a lot, I would engage, but I also came with my own preconceptions of what it meant to be a woman based on my culture, not just the Egyptian culture as most of us would think of it, but my family culture. I come from a, a group of very strong women. My grandmother led a family on her own, her husband died. So all that plays into how we view issues on the ground. Moving to Egypt, um, I, I learned certain things and you learn to engage and you learn certain things about the environment. No matter how close you are, 
uh, I think the issue of localizing is that you have to go in saying, I'm not going to be the expert, and finding an expert on the ground, um, and giving them the support internationally, whether it is through the UN, whether it is through mechanisms. You have to work with local partners and have a diversity of local partners, and not just focus on one local partner because this is the person you know. Um, or look for partners who have a diversity of local partners and who work with. And that way you'll ensure understanding and, and being culturally sensitive and referring to cultural sensitivity, I think it's important there's a difference between being localized and culturally sensitive and compromising on human rights. I think we can achieve cultural sensitivity and localizing the program and messaging without actually compromising on the rights we're demanding. Um, so I think that to me, this is the best solution that I've found. And uh, one of the things that I, one of the ways I put it is that I'm not here to speak for women or other human rights defenders on the ground. I'm here to support them to speak for themselves. So I think once we, we shift that paradigm, you'll find that the local aspect does bubble up to the top. Thank you. Claudia Selly with uh, at and I just wanted to point it out also that this issue is very dear to, uh, to business and indeed we try uh, to empower women through ICT and particularly also through education. There was someone saying that uh, we need to change from a cultural point of view and certainly this is true but we, we need to come in with uh, providing also education and what we do for example we have some initiatives uh, providing educational programs to a million of, of girls and, and also in underserved areas. Also, we try to connect them, uh, bringing connectivity and broadband to underserved areas so that we, they have access to, to information. We also, for example, another initiative we have is that we provide three years fellowship uh, to um, candidates uh, to a PhD programs. Or, um, or also, we try to engage um, as women at, at, at ETNT uh, to mentor other, other girls and to uh, show them, for example, how an engineer day uh, is. Um, so these are small things, but that can help empowering women and that can help uh, encouraging women also to continue through this path. Hello, um, I'm called Lilian Naroga. I work with a collaboration on international ICT policy in Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, I don't know, I stepped out for a few minutes. I don't know whether this was covered, but on my way between where I was and coming back here, one thing that came to my mind is much of the talk that I left in the room was about uh, covering issues of women, uh, cybercrime, women being attacked online. Why don't we focus on the issue of empowerment, not just teaching women how to use technology. In the offline world, going back to what the gentleman from Afrinik mentioned, that what happens online, offline, somehow should be reflected online. Um, I think uh, we have, uh, we've seen projects of uh, women in technology. This is something that is being, that is catching up different organizations of women who are actually using technology to enrich and uh, enrich themselves and uh, empower themselves. So for me, one thing is from Uganda, we've seen um, women achievers, profiling women who have, uh, who have made it all against all odds. So for me, I think that uh, if we are to capture such issues, I, I mean such ways of empowering women, I see so many women here who have made it. I mean women who are speaking on behalf of others, representatives, people, who, women who are using technology. So probably in the project that uh, ABC is doing with uh, Grace and all that, Instead of just focusing on gender and uh, you know cybercrime violence, look at the positive aspects of the in, of the of the technology, and maybe that way other women would be empowered to just use technology, not just hiding away from it. So I completely I completely agree with that uh, suggestion, and also that gentleman what uh, he told, because if we see the positive sides of the technology women using the positive sides of the technology and uh, in fact we can help them actually to access all their entitlements and also like 
they we can improve their economic status also then they will gain the confidence and slowly they can handle these kind of cyber crime related issues or gender related issues also see for example one example concrete example i will give from my project see uh, last uh, 2010 there was like uh, a lot of a uh, problem created by these microfinance institutions because of that many women actually they committed suicides more than four, 400 suicides happened in andhra pradesh so as we are having these women self help groups in position so what they did was like they brought out all these issues and we have conducted some kind of a case studies and the women groups they went and represented these case studies to the government of andhra pradesh then the government of andhra pradesh brought an ordinance on regulating the microfinance activities in andhra pradesh and now it attracted the whole country see so there if you see the uh, beginning of these uh, community based organizations they just started with economic thing and creation of awareness among the women members and slowly after gaining some confidence and also after having some uh, confidence levels both at uh, household and also at the society level now they are graduating into handling the higher level issues because for the poor, poor people the bread the first thing is uh, uh, the income is very very important because they are very hungry so first we need to address that particular issue and then we need to tell them even in the education thing also what i feel is instead of thinking that like uh, sending our girl children for higher education in especially in the technology related issues what i feel more comfortable is like we have to help all the community members how to use the technology for example for the last 2 years only we are making concerted efforts in our project now we are seeing lot of change in the the way they are perceiving and they and the way they are accessing the benefits and the the kind of impact it is creating on the poor people's life even the planning commission last year's report very clearly they told that uh, uh, especially because of these interventions around 10% of poverty has redu uh, reduced in, in the project so i think we need to mm -hmm. see from the positive angle also thank you i it's the last uh, um, uh, participant i will take and then i would love to go back to the uh, to the panel here um hello can you hear me um i'm nicola douglas i'm a youth delegate affiliated affiliated with childnet international and uh, the opinion i have as a young person coming from the uk um is obviously very diluted compared to some of the perspectives i've heard today um but it's it's about an issue of um freedom of expression which is something that um i feel um is very pertinent among the discussions i'm attending here um and it's it's about at my school there's these things called internet memes i don't know if you experience them on uh, in, in any of you but um it's something to do with uh, jokes about women online um for example in my school we had an assembly about um about uh women in empo female empowerment and uh the follow of this was uh some of the uh, boys in my school circulated pages on facebook saying women should be in the kitchen um which is the kind of typical uh, adult uh, male humor that uh they seem to think is a joke um which i don't really take that way but um different difference of opinion there i suppose um but well, i'd actually like to ask the panel if any of you uh, could give me an insight into how you think um we as women should deal with as as young women because i feel that freedom of expression is really important i you know i firmly believe that people should be allowed to say what they like online within reason because when you're saying things like that and you're giving those kind of generalizations i don't really like to read it but does that mean that i should uh stop stop looking at these pages is it my responsibility or is it the responsibility of someone to educate these people not to say these things or is it even the responsibility of someone to police this to say it shouldn't be online and yeah you seem like very very educated people i'd really like to know what you think about this and yeah your insight would be great thanks Thank you so much and thank you uh, so much to all of you for being so frank and for being so open. No, not now anymore. Um uh, we like to go back here now. Um so um I captured some of the principal ideas. Uh, do we have somebody remotely joining us? Okay, good. Sorry, I just forgot you completely. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> apologize. Um 
Um, and I'm sure I haven't captured all of the points, but just let me maybe read them briefly. So th let me start with the last one, freedom of expression. Is it, um, are there some rules, are there some principles? Who should govern this or shouldn't there be anybody responsible? Should we just be completely free? Um, what, what came up many times, cultural background, how important is localization? Um, this was mentioned by more than one. And is there localization, does it maybe mean that there, um, there will be some kind of uh, confrontational issues coming up automatically if you localize so that openness on the internet is given or not anymore or that you know some limitations, some cultural limitations are coming with localization automatically in certain um, nations and certain cultures? Um, the question was, wait, um, should there be more support from authorities if, um, like it, in, in your case, um, uh, where you referred to that uh, you, were, um, you had a specific case and you did not get any kind of support uh, from your government? So that's an interesting question which we have to certainly bring to the international level. Um, many references were made uh, to similarities in the online and in the offline world, and at the same time it was said that in certain countries, in, in certain regions, in certain countries, um, it is very important um, to um, get the family, um, um, you know, to empower families, to empower communities, um, so that then actually they can take on more complicated issues, uh, which they cannot if the poverty is too high. Um, Cybercrime was raised and uh, that there are um, uh, um, specific topics we need to look at, which are very specific for women um, when it comes to cybercrime. Um, and um, some uh, speakers mentioned the point that maybe cybercrime um, is um, need to focus on, uh, need to look at it from a completely different angle um, as it is doing right now. And empowerment and education. So probably there were many other topics as well. Feel completely free. Um, Grace, I start with you and I go around here, but we have uh, 10 minutes. Um, and then I really would love to conclude. So everybody keep it short, concrete recommendation. And if I miss something or somebody missed something, just raise it now. Thank you. Okay, I'll be very short. Um, in, it's unfortunate that Jack then didn't give a detailed uh, description of what we are doing. But one of the questions... We can capture this online. Don't okay. worry, Grace. Okay. We do okay. this all. Everybody who feels something is forgotten, send it to all of us. And I'm sure Aisha will find a way. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, but one of the questions that we, we asked ourselves that would make governments or authorities interested in dealing with women uh, violence, tech-based violence against women, is are we able to link the issues to economics? For example, are we able to say that if these issues uh, if women are affected by technology, that they will not contribute to the economic of the country. Because those are issues that then the regulators will be interested in. And there are also issues that men will be interested in. So maybe we need to link those two. And, and secondly, um, how do we make ICTs or technology uh, make economic sense to women so that they embrace it? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I would like first uh, to refer to the last question which was raised and actually say that uh, we should not forget that the, the freedom of a person actually ends up where the freedom of another person starts. So uh, there is no anything so, like uh, endless or unlimited freedom. Uh, with regard to the recommendations, and I think this is a very good approach because we have to be pragmat pragma uh, pragmatic and uh, representing the Commission and uh, European institutions, what we have to, to make sure is that there is indeed a holistic approach and there are coordinated efforts. There are uh, plenty of programs, plenty of good examples, plenty of initiatives. But in order to make uh, the women a voice heard and make really a difference with their presence in ICT, there should be a more coordinated approach. Uh, and one last point uh, which I would like to make is uh, we need inspiration. We need really very good role models to make sure that uh, girls and women are inspired to study and stay in ICT. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, I just want to refer to the last question. Unfortunately, uh, patriarchy is not as rejected as feminism at the moment. So I can't really uh, say that uh, the, the, the views expressed by your colleagues are really violence. Uh, but uh, w what can I say is, is, is about freedom of expression online, the, the limits for it is the incitement to violence. So if it's mere opinion internationally, it would be okay for them to express it. And, and I would advise you to write back as well, because this is the only tool that we have to write back and, and explain and be heard as well as they are heard. Otherwise, we will leave them alone talking to themselves and to others uh, as if there's no other uh, opinion uh, for them. So that's all. Uh, in the technology, uh, while designing the technology, we have to actually uh, keep the poor people's requirement in mind and especially the women and the illiterate members. So because in, in all the development countries, so 30 to 50 percent of the people will be in that particular category. So we have to keep that in mind and then we have to focus on how can we create awareness among all those members, how can we train them, how can we make business models so that they can take ICT as one of the business opportunities. So the, I think I I think we lost your last half of the sentence. Last half of this. What I told was like uh, uh, the viability because if the women, if they want to take uh, the technology based micro enterprises, then they have to be very viable. So for that, we need to build some good models and we have to create that kind of an awareness among women to take this as a livelihood opportunity. So um, many of the issues we've discussed here are issues that have um, exist in the offline world, but with the online world, we've had the opportunity uh, for women to be much more empowered, um, to be, uh, have access to information, have access to a range of, of issues. Uh, but underneath that is actually the underlying infrastructure and that the Internet exists. Uh, so I think we need to take a step back from the context of it's an empowering environment and it's multi-stakeholder, also among women's issues. And to build on Grace's point, uh, women technology and economic growth are mixed together. Uh, businesses have an, an interest, obviously, from an investment in serving consumers and users. Uh, but it's also very important that you have an enabling environment, that you have regulations and policies that enable the internet and ICT to continue to grow, to enable access, uh, e-health, e-education, uh, issues that will then facilitate opportunities for women in that regard, ease the cost and uh, efficiency of use. So when I look at this conversation, I also think we need to ensure that we, we create this enabling environment that allows us to also have dialogues in a much easier way across borders and with each other uh, in order to try to find solutions to issues and not lose light of we need to keep this enabling environment in place. Okay, let me thank the organizers. Um, do you want to make a, a, a point, recommendation, when you would love to say something um, now? The two of you, please, please feel free, go. Whoever wants to go first, please. I'll Aisha. just go ahead. So I'm, I'm really pleased that we were able to bring together this broad range of views and and the, the number of issues that have been put up on the wall this time. I'm, I wanted to acknowledge that this workshop came together because last year Alice Munya of Kenya, as the host country, motivated a number of us to have a special event, uh, a workshop hosted by the host country uh, to bring up women and internet governance issues. And this year we've seen these issues come up to the main session on access and diversity and will be talked about in other environments. Um, so this APC, ICC basis, Government of Kenya workshop uh, was meant to be a building block and we look forward to continuing this dialogue in all, all of its dimensions. So thank you. Pardon me, just for the record, that was Aisha Hassan from ICC Basis. Thank you. Hello? 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 Um, 
Hi, I'm Jack from APC, and I'm the Women's Rights Policy Coordinator. Thank you so much um, for this really, really interesting conversation. I think this is, is a testament to the amazing space that the IGF is, that we are able to sit here and bring you know, all these very, very different perspectives and have a really frank, open and, and a constructive conversation. And I think for me personally, what I'm bringing from this space is that really culture and social norms act as both a, a real significant barrier to women's access to ICTs and to be able to you know, explore the opportunities that's available, no doubt. Um, the internet is a very empowering space, but at the same time, all of the issues that we have offline in terms of defining culture, not just be like, you know, have culture be done upon us, uh, but to also be able to shape it and define it. I think that's one of the key powers of the internet, that we need to be able to think of how to do better in terms of our policy making and all of our programming on education, on economics and so on. Like, how, how can we then help to make this um, more empowering? Um, and in that sense, I feel very um, excited to hear about Verizon, about AT&T, and also about DigiConnect and your interest in education, and also to see if there's any possibility of exploring education, not just in terms of skills, but also addressing the culture, and that sometimes a very macho culture um, in technology as well, and how to deal with these issues. Um, and finally, on leadership. I think um, this is something that's very key, and I'm really interested to support like more leadership of women and girls in internet governance issues, and I'm very keen to see how we can work together in a very multi um basis to try and push this, and as Aisha said, it's a building block, and we really hope to be able to build this more and more um, together in the future. Thank you. Okay, I think this was a perfect last word. There's nothing to be said anymore. Um, wonderful conclusion. Uh, I want to thank you all, uh, the speakers, um, um, everybody else who was engaged in the discussion, and I hope we will have another chance again, um, the organizers of course, and I hope we have another chance again um, to meet and to discuss and to continue to discuss the topic. Please don't forget um, to send the references which were made here um, so that we have them included either as link or however uh, they can be made. And um, thank you so much for having me as a moderator. It was a pleasure um, to discuss it with you. Thanks so much. And thank you, Erica. Thank you.